Good morning, and welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday in Advent. My name is Seth Novak, and as the pastor of Anis Day Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this service today. The building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with an order of service from the link in the video description below. Today, as we gather, we also remember Katharina von Bora Luther. <clears throat> Katharina, or Katie as she's lovingly called, was sent to a monastery by her father when she was five years old. She grew up among the uh, Benedictines and then the Cistercians, and as a young woman she became interested in this little reform movement in Germany. Uh, perhaps you've heard of it? She conspired with several of the other nuns of her cloister to escape. As the legend goes, they hid among the herring barrels in the back of a covered wagon which delivered them to Wittenberg, where young upstart reformer Martin Luther helped arrange homes, marriages, and employment for the women. After two years, he had them all squared away, all except one. Katharina had a few suitors, but none were interested in marriage, and she herself was interested only in Martin. The two eventually wed, and Katie became the manager of the Luther household. <clears throat> She's remembered for her level head and her quick wit, which was admired by her husband and many others. She and Martin had six children, four of whom survived to adulthood. There's another story about Katie I heard once from a Luther scholar, that one night when Martin and his all-male colleagues were gathered around for one of their regular table talk theological discussions, the, dis the uh, topic turned to baptism. Katie was ladling out soup to the guests while her husband stated boldly, I think we should practice infant baptism by full immersion. <clears throat> To which Katie, in between scoops of supper, cracked Martin over the head with the ladle and responded, Nicked meine Kinder, before uh, delivering the next bowl full of soup without missing a beat. And thus, to this day, Lutherans still do not widely practice full immersion infant baptism. We are grateful today for Katie and for the love that she shared not only with Martin and her family, but with her many friends and acquaintances and with generations of Christians after. We remember her for her tireless spirit and her contributions to, Protest to the Protestant Reformation and to the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Katie died on this day in 1552 at the age of 53, four years after her husband. Finally, before we begin our worship today, uh, we share prayer concerns for our community. If you have prayer concerns that you would like to share, I'll, I will invite you to add them now to the chat or to the comments. Uh, we remember today uh, Katie Hayes' grandpa, John, who was hospitalized this week uh, with a serious problem, but he is home now and recovering. And so we pray for John and uh, Katie and their whole family. I invite you to turn to your bulletin as we begin our worship. Blessed be God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free. Free from all that holds you back free to live in God's peaceable realm. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
because too many people are wandering in the wilderness, because too many people are sitting in the valley of the shadow of death, we light candles. Because people all over the world are suffering and we are too busy to notice, we light candles. Today we stop everything and light these candles, one for hope, one for peace, one for joy, and one for love. May the light from these candles overwhelm the world. May the light from these candles illuminate the valley of the shadow of death. May the light and the fire from these candles burn away everything that is preventing God's love from being born among us. Siblings in Christ, be not afraid. Even now, even now, God's love is overwhelming the world. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly we may bear your redeeming love to all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The lesson for the day is from 2 Samuel 7. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind for the Lord is with you. But the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be a prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you, wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more, and the evildoers shall afflict them no more. As formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Word of God, word of life.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. In my experience, we often want to use this story to praise Mary to see in it how humble, how faithful, how obedient she is. Rebecca Crow shared this week that she once asked a Roman Catholic priest why the Catholic Church is so fond of Mary. And his response was something along the lines of, well, God thought she was pretty amazing, so don't you think that's worth something? In reality, I think the whole point of this story is that Mary is utterly unremarkable. She's the polar opposite of Mary Poppins. She's absolutely average in every way. God could have chosen anyone. In fact, God did choose anyone. That's how Mary got the job in the first place. God wasn't looking for someone with power or privilege or wealth, but an average, ordinary person. How many other young women just like her were living in Galilee at that time? Dozens? Hundreds? Thousands? And sure, Joseph is a uh, descendant of King David, but at 14 generations removed, how many shirt tail relatives must he have had, other heirs to David's line? To turn this story into a praise of Mary misses the point entirely. But one thing that is remarkable about Mary is her response to the angel's message. She doesn't consider what this is gonna cost her and say no, but neither does she say yes. She doesn't think about the great privilege that will come with being the mother to God's son and greedily accept this, counting whatever cost as worthwhile. Instead, all she says is, it is what it is. Let it be with me according to your word. You might hear resignation in this, or maybe you hear acceptance, but I hear something else. I hear trust. I hear a hope in something that is larger than herself. You see, Mary knows better than anyone that she is not worthy to be the mother of the Messiah. She knows that she's nothing special. And because she knows this, she knows that God is not doing this for her. Not because she deserves it, not because she needs it, not because she wants it. She knows that this is not about her at all that she is incidental to this equation. She knows that God will do this with or without her. And that means that God is doing this for the world. That is what she trusts. Not that this will bless her, but that this will bless everyone. Last week, I shared with you what Thomas Merton wrote about the point of nothingness that exists at the center of each of us. He says, this little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. 
It is, so to speak, God's name written in us as our poverty, as our indigence, as our dependence, as our birthright. Now, poverty and indigence and dependence don't sound like good qualities, but Merton says they're not only good, they're gifts. They're our inheritance from God. To recognize them as such helps us to know that we have nothing that God needs. We have nothing to bring to the table. Unlike King David, we know that God doesn't need us. And that can only mean that God wants us. That God chooses us. All the things that we call gifts, all our talents and skills and resources and right actions and good deeds and good intentions, all of it are not ours. They all come from God. God made David who he was, brought him up from tending sheep to lead a nation. And so it's actually comical for David then to look at God in pity and believe that God needs him to provide a house? But it's just as comical and just as tragically misguided for us to believe that it's our good actions that God needs. For us to believe that God needs us to donate what we have to God's cause. Because all that we have has been given to us by God in the first place. It's all already at God's disposal, which can only mean that God has disposed of it by giving it to us. Like Mary, we have somehow found ourselves unexpectedly in favor with God, completely irrespective of who we are or what we've done. To understand and embrace this is to admit that we are nothing, that we have nothing, that we can do nothing, that God has done everything, that we have received, in the words of St. John, grace upon grace. Now, since these things already belong to God, it means that God has blessed us with them for the same reason that God blessed Mary with a surprise pregnancy, to bring forth God's love into the world. Because these gifts belong to God and not to us, we never have to worry about running out of them because they come from the one true source, the fountain of living water which never runs dry. Now that's a much different attitude than most of us have about ourselves and our things, isn't it? Most of the time we're worried about not having enough, about spreading ourselves too thin or overcommitting ourselves. We spend so much time and energy trying to protect ourselves and our resources, trying to fill ourselves up and make sure we don't run out of time or money or energy. I know this is true because this is my story. Prior to my sabbatical, I was utterly spent. I had nothing left to give. I'd given too much, said yes too often, and I had nothing left over for myself. Over the summer, I took time for me, and I remembered the importance of caring for myself, of keeping my boundaries secure so I could always have enough to share. And that's a good thing to remember. Since I've been back, I've been very intentional about those boundaries, about saying no more, about not overcommitting myself. And you know what? I've been experiencing the same emptiness as before. I have plenty in reserve but I've not been around when people need me. I've been selfish about my time. I've not felt more connected, any more connected to God than before I left. I actually cried last week during the confession as I realized this. The recognition that I've been failing to do the one thing that I want more than anything else, to love as I have been loved, brought me to tears. My problem, our problem, is that we think dualistically in terms of me or you. I can serve one or the other, but not both. But like I said last week, me and you are illusions. 
They're constructed identities that we use to make sense of the world. The one true reality is there is no me any more than there is a you. That there is only the light, which is the life of all creation. The pure glory of God that shines within all of us. When I, when I try too hard to serve you, I become an enabler. I run myself dry. When I try too hard to serve me, I become selfish and I've got nothing to share. Either way, I cut myself off from the one true source because I'm trying too hard to control what I'm doing. I'm holding too tightly onto how much I'm loving or how I am serving or how if I am doing it right. To really love is not to serve myself or yourself, but the one true self, the self of which we are all a part. It's to let go of the illusion that you or I are not branches of the same vine or sandcastles made from the same sand. This is perhaps what Mary comes to understand in the presence of the angel, that this pregnancy isn't her blessing, nor is it a blessing that belongs just to others. It's God's blessing for all of us together. And so she lets go of her worries, her needs, her sufferings, and lets the glory of God fill her, lets the power of the Spirit overshadow her, and all humanity is blessed. When we believe that Jesus has come here to offer us some divine evacuation plan to help us escape the clutches of sin and death, we reduce God's good news to what Jesus can do for me personally. It makes Jesus' birth all about me, about giving into the illusion of myself as separate from the light that shines in the darkness. What if? What if instead of believing that Christ came to fulfill each of us separately, we begin to trust that we are here to fulfill Christ? to serve the light that shines within all of us. That the true light shining in us really does intend to enlighten all people, all creation. To engage in that trust means letting go like Mary and trusting in a reality, in a hope that we cannot yet perceive. This kind of letting go is not for the faint of heart but it is God's invitation for all of us. When Mary lets go and empties herself, not for her own sake, mind you, and not for the sake of others, but for the sake of what God has called her to do, then she finds that the way up is down. That when she empties herself, God then becomes her fullness. Merton calls that point of nothingness the Pont Vierge, the blank point or the virgin point, the point which, in his words, is untouched by sin and illusion, a point or a spark which belongs entirely to God, which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. If we can learn to embrace that point vierge, to admit our absolute poverty, our poverty even of self, to let go of that illusion that I am separate from you, separate from everyone else in the world, then the divine love somehow becomes incarnate in us, not by our power, not because we are worthy, but only by God's spirit. I'm still figuring out what that means, what that looks like, how to live that in my life, how to even understand that fully. But I trust that it's true. That's what it is for us to wait for God's kingdom, I think. To wait, to watch, to hope, to wrestle, to let go. Always knowing that Christ is coming with or without us, 
that we have been invited to bear this divine love in our own flesh, to shine with the light of Christ in the darkness. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. For the whole church, its ministry, and the mission of the gospel. For peace and justice in the world, the nations and those in authority, and our local community. For the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved, lonely. For all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. For on you stay, and for the people closest to us. For the faithful departed. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Advent is a season of waiting and preparing for God. Right now, I'd like to invite you to prepare your gifts of bread and wine or juice to share the Eucharist from your home. In this meal, God takes the humble gifts that we donate and uses them to nourish us, body and soul. In the same way, 
God takes all the humble gifts that we donate to this ministry and uses them to bless us so that we may in turn bless the world. If you'd like to join me in supporting the ministry of God's blessing through Anuste Lutheran Church, you can find a link in the video description to our webpage, where you can give a one-time gift or set up a recurring donation to support the ministry of God's blessing here. Thank you for your generosity and for your presence here today. Mysterious God, in the beginning the darkness waited, and you created light. Sarah and Abraham waited for a future, and you sent descendants greater than the stars. The Hebrew slaves waited for rescue. You sent Miriam and Moses to enact your liberation. Israel waited in exile for renewal. And you empowered prophets and poets with your life-giving speech. As the whole world groaned in waiting for release and rebirth, you sent Jesus, born of strong Mary, fathered by humble Joseph, incarnate in our humility, in solidarity with our suffering and the poor, full of wisdom and grace for all. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Hoping beyond hope, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. 
Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering all your promises fulfilled in Jesus' body given for the beloved universe, in the great hope of the resurrection and in all that is to come by your mercy, with eager expectation we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. Send your spirit into this broken world, into our hopeful, imperfect gathering, and on this sacred bread and wine, so that we may be healed and whole again and be filled with the courage to love. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and thanks to you, Holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your Spirit, here and now and into the great beyond. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal this morning, then receive this blessing. May the peace and love of Christ be born in you this day and forevermore. Amen. If you are receiving the meal, then hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and abundant God, you have done great things for us and we rejoice. In this bread and cup you give us life forever. In your boundless mercy strengthen us and open our hearts to the world's needs. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd like to share just a few announcements. First of all, thank you all so very much for sharing so many wonderful Advent wreath photos and videos uh, with us this season. <clears throat> Being able to see so many friends in worship has lifted everybody's spirits during this strange and uh, different Advent. And so I'm very grateful for all the enthusiasm and the joy with which you've uh, reached out to care for one another in this way. Thank you so very much. Next week, as you know, it's Christmas, and although we'll be celebrating the holiday a little bit differently this year, we do still plan to worship together. Beginning today, you'll find the Blue Christmas service available on our YouTube channel. Sometimes the pressure to be joyful at Christmas can be overwhelming. Blue Christmas is a service that acknowledges that there are a lot of other emotions that accompany this time of year. Emotions around grief and loneliness and loss and many other things. That service wants to make space for all of those emotions, um, as well as for uh, maybe just celebrating Christmas in a way that is a little bit more contemplative and, and sedate. Um, to recognize that Christmas comes in a variety of ways. 
Since tomorrow is the winter solstice, the longest night of the year, we worship with Blue Christmas as a time to pause amid the darkness and hope for the light. You may join the Blue Christmas worship anytime you like during this week, but we especially suggest that you uh, worship this evening or tomorrow evening in conjunction with the solstice uh, to sit in that darkness and pray for light. Our regular Christmas worship will also be available beginning Thursday, December 24th. We thought about trying to do something live via Zoom uh, to celebrate the festive occasion, um, but we've been told that uh, it's very likely that bandwidth is going to be very scarce at that time because everybody and their dog is going to be trying to worship that evening. So rather than set up something that uh, would likely fall flat and disappoint us, we decided to pre-record a service so that everybody who wants to can participate. <clears throat> this will be our only Christmas service, but you're welcome to uh, join in anytime you like, whether that's uh, mid-afternoon on Christmas Eve or late morning on Christmas Day, or if you really want, you can even uh, have real live midnight mass on Christmas Eve, just like, just like it was when you were growing up. Um, we are going to have um, our traditional candlelight singing of Silent Night. And so if you'd like, we'll invite you to have a candle ready so you can turn out the lights and sing that hymn uh, together. It's a way of recognizing that even though things are very different this year, in some ways, we're all still kind of huddled in the dark together, um, praying, against, praying against the darkness, just like we normally do, even if we're a little bit more spread out this year. Then on uh, Sunday, the 27th, our regular worship will be available on YouTube at the normal time at 9.45 a.m. We'll gather there with our entire synod for a service of lessons and carols. And I'm really excited about this because um, this technology that allows us to gather even while we're separated opens up a lot of opportunities for us to remember that uh, the church is a lot larger than just our little congregation that we are gathered even just in this part of the state with dozens of other congregations. And this is a chance for us all to join together in worship, uh, to celebrate together something that's very dear to us. So I hope you'll, you'll uh, join us for that worship service. All of these worship times, as well as links to the services and bulletins for worship will be available on our homepage on youstaylutheran.org. Once again, thank you so much for being a part of this worship service today. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. And even uh, maybe take the link to this video and share it on your Facebook page so that, uh, or, or email it to a friend so that you can worship together. It's just one of the ways that we can share what's giving us strength with one another in these times. Our daily Advent devotions will continue uh, every night this week through the 23rd at 7 p.m. on Zoom. You can find the link to that Zoom devotion as well as links to the other various meetings and activities happening in our congregation under the events tab on our website. Now go in peace. Christ is with you. Amen. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know with a phone call or a text or an email. God bless you on your week.